Hi, my name is Sarah Schultz, and I'm here to talk to you about my research in experimental replication of Oneota pottery. This research specifically focused on analyzing the paddle and anvil method of pottery production, and not only discusses the evidence for this method, but also demonstrates the result of an experimental study in recreating this pottery. Oneota is a cultural complex that existed in the Eastern Plains and Great Lakes area of the United States from 900 to 1700 AD. This complex is a regional variation of the larger Mississippian complex that dominated the Eastern United States during this time. The Mississippian complex brought about a drastic cultural change and introduced many things, including agriculture, more sedentary settlements, as well as the change in the type of pottery being produced. Unlike their previous small and thick-walled woodland predecessors, Oneota pots are significantly larger and incredibly thin globular pots. Structurally, the pots are significantly different with Oneota pots having burn shell as a tempering agent instead of grit or sand. Furthermore, the shell temper is unique in the fact that it laminates perfectly with the curvature of the clay body. This lamination effect is thought to increase the strength of the walls. These large and thin pots have been difficult for archaeologists to understand and reproduce. Some experimental work has been done to reproduce these pots strictly through using coil construction, and while experiments were successful in reproducing the general size and thickness of these pots, around 80% of the pots would collapse while they were being constructed. For the vessels that were completed through the entire process, it was estimated that it took roughly six to eight hours to complete. These experiments also produce some degree of temper lamination. However, some of the photographs indicate that this lamination may not have been consistent throughout the clay body. While these experiments did demonstrate that this method is possible, the high failure rate and huge time commitment indicate that this method is likely not feasible. Furthermore, while the coil method is possible, there is no evidence that directly suggests that Oneota pots are being made with coils, since Oneota pots do not exhibit coil breaks or other key markers of strictly coil-built pottery. For these experiments, I wanted to try a different approach and explore an alternative explanation. To do this, I have focused my initial research on analyzing the artifacts for clues on how they could have been made. Overall, there are a handful of different methods for identifying forming techniques in pottery, and my research primarily focused on four specific characteristics, including surface markings, variation in wall thickness, preferred orientations of inclusions, and vessel shape. These four categories were analyzed from a sample of Oneo de Shards from the La Crosse region of Wisconsin. First, the large globular shape of the pots were analyzed. These pots are characterized by their round base with a slightly narrower neck and almost always have two handles on either sides of the rim. These pots generally feature decoration on the shoulder or rim of the pots and feature either line or punctate designs. The rest of the pot is left with a smooth finish. Next, the orientation of inclusions was analyzed. Preferred orientations of inclusions looks at the alignment of inclusions and voids within the walls of the clay body. The shell tempering in Oneota pots form small platelets that arrange in a tight lamination throughout the clay body. This lamination occurs when pressure is applied to plastic clay, causing the clay minerals and temper to become aligned perpendicular to the direction of the force. This tight lamination indicates that a considerable amount of force was applied to the clay body while it was still in its plastic state. Furthermore, this lamination is fairly uniform throughout the clay body, indicating that the entire pot is going through the same type of treatment. While this process is mostly uniform, it is important to note that on average, the shoulders demonstrate the highest degree of lamination and thinness, while the bases are thicker and the shell lamination is lesser. As far as surface markings go, Oneota pottery is known for their smooth exteriors and feature punctates or lines as decoration. While the outside of the pots are smooth, it is important to note that they are not burnished. Through analyzing many different pots, there is one characteristic that began to stand out that is not associated with decoration. 
Although it is not present on all vessels, it is not uncommon to find vertical impressions along the neck and sometimes handles of these pots. These impressions only correlate with portions of the pots that are concave like the neck and are not present on portions of the pots that are convex like the body. Next, the variation in wall thickness was looked at. While on average oniota pots are quite thin, the wall thickness is not consistent throughout the clay body. While on the outside the pots look smooth and uniform, the cross sections of the pottery and the insides of the vessels show a very different story. Wall thickness fluctuates greatly through the walls of the vessels, leaving what appear to be indents all along the insides. While these indents can be viewed in the cross sections of pots and can be felt on the insides of these pots, these depressions are so faint they are often indistinguishable. All of these characteristics are key indicators of the paddle and anvil method of pottery production, which include overlapping or closely spaced depressions on the interior of the pots, facets on the exterior of the pots left by a flat beater, variation in wall thickness corresponding to the exterior facets and interior grooves, and also featuring perfectly preferred orientations of inclusions. The paddle and anvil is a secondary forming technique that is utilized on a pre-constructed and partially dried clay vessel. The initial vessel can be made a number of ways, including vessels thrown on the wheel or built with coils or slabs. As the clay vessel dries to a semi-dry or leather hard stage, the clay becomes much stiffer than it was at the preliminary forming stage, while still remaining somewhat malleable. At this stage, the clay is beat in between two hard objects, which often are a wooden paddle on the outside and some kind of anvil being braced on the inside of the pot. Pottery anvils can be made out of stone, a balled fist, or even made from fired clay or wood. Beating the malleable clay between two hard objects causes opposing pressure, which compresses and displaces the clay body between the two objects. This compression thins and expands the clay body, as well as aligns the inclusions present within the walls of the plot and obliterates coil breaks. This beating of the clay can have a dramatic impact on the finished shape of the pot. Various ethnographic videos demonstrate how this technique is still used today on wheel thrown vessels to create pots twice as big as the original vessel. This doubling in the volume of the pots means that a tremendous amount of the clay of the walls is being displaced. And as a result, the pots are considerably much thinner than they were before they were beaten. In fact, starting with a thick pot is essential for accommodating this level of transformation. Lastly, since the clay is being displaced at a semi-dry phase, it can much more easily hold its shape and is not as prone to sinking or collapsing under its own weight. Beating with a paddle and anvil is utilized to create incredibly large and thin pots that would run the risk of collapsing if they were wheel thrown or coil built. While all of this evidence points strongly to the paddle and anvil technique, replicating this process through experimentation would further lend credibility to this method and shed light on many of the nuances and technical aspects of this method. Based on the evidence collected, I designed my experiments around the theory that if the paddle and anvil process significantly transforms the clay body, certain physical features will be a direct result of this process. Also, if experimental recreations using the paddle and anvil exhibit the same physical features as oniota pottery, this supports the claim that this is how they were constructed. For my experiments, I used a mixture of stoneware clay and mussel shells. These experiments were conducted in England, so it was not feasible to obtain local clay from the United States to use in these experiments. Instead, stoneware clay was utilized as a substitute for its highly elastic properties. For temper in these experiments, mussel shells were burned and crushed. Preliminary experiments were conducted to determine the approximate ratio of clay to shell found in oniota sherds. These results indicate that the sherds ranged from around 30% shell temper to dry clay. And this is what was used in these experiments. The clay body of the vessels was constructed using relatively large two centimeter coils to allow for the entire base of the structure to be created in one sitting. 
After that, the clay body was left to dry for a day or two until it was at the semi-dry or leather hard stage. To document the total transformation the pots would go through during this process, the pre-paddled pot was photographed in front of a grid and the vessel wall thickness was measured in various places throughout the vessel using a pin. The pot was then beaten using a wooden paddle and a round stone. This was repeated various times, and over the course of the experiments, it was found that multiple paddling and drying sessions could be utilized on a single vessel to thin it further. After the pot was paddled, it was photographed again in front of the same grid and wall thickness was measured at specific intervals again using a pin. These photographs were then overlaid and an image documenting the before and after size was created. The wall thickness was also plotted on a graph to demonstrate how thin the pot had become and correlate where the pots had thinned most. Afterwards, the pots were fired in an electric kiln and broken, and attributes such as surface markings, variation in wall thickness, and lamination of the shell temper were analyzed. Throughout these experiments, five vessels were completed, and throughout these experiments, larger and thinner pots were able to be achieved. Furthermore, all of these pots demonstrated the key markers associated with the paddle and anvil. Horizontal impressions or facets from the paddle were identified on portions of the pottery. While the entire clay body was beat using the wooden paddle, these impressions were only found on concave portions of the pottery like the neck and were not found on the body. Depressions and an even wall thickness were also documented. However, at times it was difficult to visually see these depressions on the insides of these pots. While they were not always visible, they could be felt on the insides of these pots and this undulation could be seen within broken pottery sherds. Temper lamination was documented within broken pottery shirts, and the tightness of the lamination was correlated to areas of the pots that had been thinned the most. This suggests that pottery lamination is a direct result of this compression. Overall, the pots went through a substantial transformation within this process, and it was also found that the wall thickness of the pots decreased by up to 50% in some of these vessels, with the thinnest areas of these pots often found to be the shoulders. This experiment resulted in the completion of several Oneida style vessels that successfully replicated different attributes that had been identified in Oneida pottery sherds. The results of this experiment can be used in future experimental archeology span research to incorporate local clay as well as to be used in experimental pottery firing research or cooking experiments. Overall, since these markings identified within this experiment have gone largely overlooked in the Oneota literature, it is difficult to determine how these results would compare to Oneota collections outside of the La Crosse region of Wisconsin. The results of these experiments can be utilized by archaeologists to help determine construction methods within their own collections and through comparing these results, the larger trend of construction methods as a whole can be studied and mapped in a way that it hasn't been before. Overall, I'd like to give a very special thank you to the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center for giving me access to their Oneota collection. And I'd also like to thank anyone who guided me and supported me during this research, including Eric Anderson, Linda Harcomb, Colin Betts, Joe Tiffany, John Kiernan, and Angie Wickenden.